hey, we're core organizing a live event at the San Francisco Blockchain Week. It's called SF Blockchain Epicenter, and it'll be October 8th and 9th at the Hilton Union Square. You can come see members of the Epicenter team and a lot of familiar faces from the show. Uh, there are reduced rates for developers, and you can learn more at sfblockchainweek.io. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. And by TopDAO. TopDAO is addressing the talent shortage in the blockchain space, connecting companies of all sizes with the world's best blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team, check out toptal.com slash epicenter. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we are pleased to welcome back on the show Arthur Brightman, who is one of the co-founders of Tezos. Joining Arthur Brightman is Kathleen Brightman, who is on Epicenter for the first time. Kathleen is also a co-founder of Tezos. So Arthur and Kathleen, welcome on the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So before we start the show, uh, we'd like to disclaim that both Brian and I participated in the Tezos fund fundraiser and we continue to hold our tesis. So we are not exactly neutral interviewers for this episode. Now, with that, uh, Brian, you want to say something on that? Now, of course, Tezos, we've we've been aware for a long time and our listeners have been aware for a long time. Actually, one of our most popular episodes was was with, with Arthur back then. I think we've uh, had maybe 40, 50,000 uh, downloads on that one. And that was in a long time ago in 2016, or at least a long time ago in, in uh, Bitcoin age uh, or blockchain age. And uh, that was around a year before the fundraiser. And already at the time, the the Tezos white paper actually was quite old. So the Tezos white paper was originally published, I think, in 2014 under the, um, the name L.M. Goodman. And some who've been around in the blockchain space for a long time may, may this may ring a bell, L.M. Goodman. Of course, there was this journalist, Leah McGrath Goodman, who had basically outed this poor guy uh, in California. So that was, that was Tezos' first encounter with uh, really bad investigative journalism. Yeah, yeah, no, that was definitely a <laughs> remarkable episode. So that was named after that. And uh, I think at the time you were still working in uh, in banking and then afterwards spent some time at Google and was kind of developing a Tezos on the side. And then so it's been a really long time until, uh, you know, the fundraiser happened. And now, of course, at this point, Tezos being, you know, a live project and, and uh, quite a vibrant project. It's been a long pregnancy, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So one of the things I thought would be interesting to talk about a little bit to start this off is, can you give a bit of context? Like, how did you s decide back then to, you know, work on Tezos? And what were the main, uh, the main triggers for the core ideas of the white paper back then? Well, what I found really interesting was the idea that um, these this blockchain systems that represented commons and Bitcoin had a way of paying for a, decentral, uh, a decentralized way of paying for a commons, which was the security of the network. But um, it didn't, you know, that was very, uh, it had very minim minimal governance. And on one hand, it's good to have minimal governance because you, um, you have a smaller surface area to attack. But on the other hand, there was also a lot of innovation uh, coming in this field. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of smart contracts uh, in Ethereum, or um, zero knowledge proofs of knowledge transactions uh, in zero cash and later Zcash. So all of these uh, things were happening and I, I didn't see a very clear path for how they would make their way um, into Bitcoin without explicit governance. And I, I became fascinated with the idea of um, what, 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 what happened during fork based governance and what happened if you had more formal governance. To me, it always seems so visionary that um 
the tezos white paper was published before the bitcoin block size drama happened so kind of you anticipated that a problem like that was going to develop and already had written a solution like at least a solution that could work in practice but then as uh, as time passed on tezos also acquired its second flavor which was around smart contract safety right so how, how did that come about yeah and you know you, you can see the, the the safety aspect is present in uh, in your uh, original papers one of the thing um i i got really interested in was formal verification uh, as a technology so it's it's been around for a long time it's the idea of treating a program as a mathematical expression and making mathematical proofs about your program it's typically been uh, uh it's typically required a lot of expertise and a lot of time and efforts and so it's been used in cases where the bugs are extremely costly for example aeronautics where if you have one bug your rockets can go crashing down instead of going up that that's something that actually happened uh and so smart contracts are or 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 even you know in, in general the code base that underpin this digital assets are really prime example of small code bases that could easily be, that that could be verified not necessarily easily uh, uh and 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 for which there is really a, a um it makes financial sense to actually verify those code bases, and at the same time, the tools and technology for doing formal verification has been gotten e has gotten easier and easier. So there are better libraries for the uh, theorem provers like Coq. You also have automated uh, provers using SMT solvers. So all of this field has been making strides, and at the same time, we have a perfect candidate uh, for it. So it, it, it seemed like a really good fit. So of course that's that has been absolutely correct in both of those points, right? Governance has become a massive topic. I think today lots of new blockchain projects come, and governance is always one aspect that they're you know they're aware that's a problem. There there has to be some some solution around that. Formal verification as well, or like smart contract security and sec blockchain security has become massive. Of course, after the Tezos white paper, we have things like the DAO hack and uh, in the parody multi-sig box and other things like that that have really made that very apparent. But one of the other things that I thought was interesting is that today, if you look, if you ask people, what are the biggest issues in blockchain? They would probably would say number one would be scalability, I think. And then uh, interoperability is another one. Probably interoperability, scalability, and governance, I would say, would probably be the number th the, the three. Uh, although I'm sure some people would have different answers. Uh, and on, on scalability and interoperability, that hasn't been a topic for Tezos. In, it wasn't in the white paper. Do you think this is something that was um, sort of, it should have been more of a focus of Tezos? Uh, that's a good question. It, it, it's definitely, you know, um, so th there, you mentioned two, uh, two things that weren't mentioned. One was uh, interoperability and the other one was throughput. Uh, in terms of throughput, I think there, there definitely needs to be a higher throughput than the four transaction or ten transactions per second that you um, that you see on most uh, on most blockchains. Uh, however, uh, I've I've always been on the mind that the best solutions for throughput were pretty much second layer solution. So things like the Lightning Network, or even you know not necessarily not not even necessarily trustless things. Um, I so different people see different things in the uh, uh, in this in, in this market, and for me, I haven't I don't necessarily think so much as cryptocurrencies as a way to disintermediate, but more as a way of making the the system of intermediation permissionless. And so, uh, in this respect, I've, I've historically been less interested in uh, in throughput. Although in terms of throughput, you know, just moving from a proof of work to a proof of stake system uh, increase can, can increase your throughput greatly. Although you, you can get the same thing uh, in proof of work using uh, Bitcoin NG type of uh, of model, but so th there there's a lot of uh, of ways to get more on chain scalability. Not you know get not get a thousand x or ten thousand x, but like reasonable gains that really makes the level two solutions practical. I also think that the reason everyone is so focused on throughput right now is because of a narrative around Ethereum DAP. So in the first phase, you had people who figured out that like hey. If I create an application and somehow I manage to tie it with a token, even though that not necessarily makes sense, then maybe I can make money. You know, maybe I'll make money this way, and then you know people will use a token. Uh, and so they try to build these applications, and none of them really uh, pan out that well. Perhaps because it's early, but I think perhaps because a lot of the times the, the the tokens or the applications themselves didn't make a whole lot of sense. They were applications which were perfectly fine as being centralized, and people were decentralizing them 
for the sake of using tokens. And so when, you know, when it became apparent that that wasn't, really wasn't going to work, people pointed out at CryptoKitties and said like, oh, well, the problem, you know, of course, everyone would be working on all these great dApps. The only problem is we just don't have the throughput to do it, right? You know, we would have decentralized Facebook, decentralized all of it. We just need to have the throughput necessary on the blockchain and finally we'll be able to do that. And so I think that's one of the, um, that's one of, definitely one of the um, uh, marketing angle of, uh, of EOS. I don't think that's true. I think that the problem is product market fit and the fact that decentralization is only useful in specific cases. And so I, 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 don't, I generally don't think that throughput is going to make dApps uh, popular. I definitely think it's going to make for the next few years uh, high throughput uh, blockchains popular because I think it's a beauty contest and people will, will use the throughput as a mark of beauty as opposed to something that's really uh, important for their platform. So you'll, you'll have a lot of discussions of throughput, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it, it, it's not as important. The other one is uh, interoperability. So interoperability assumes that you have many different blockchains, a very uh, heterogeneous ecosystem. And that makes sense if there's some trade-offs. So if one way to design a blockchain, uh, let's say you want to design a blockchain for smart contracts, and now you want to design a blockchain for payments, and somehow uh, making, you know, designing it for payments or for store of value makes it very different than the design you would use for smart contracts, then now you need to have these two blockchains because you have all these different use cases which require a different architecture. In that case, interoperability would be very important because you would like these blockchains to talk to each other. But I don't believe that there are such trade-offs. I think there's very, very few trade-offs in, uh, in the design of blockchains. One of it is, I think, decentralization and throughput. Uh, that's good. Uh, I'm, more generally speaking, you know, how decentralized you want to be and how safe, and, and safe in a very like general sense. You want to make sure that uh, anyone can participate and everyone kind of agrees, so you proceed very slowly and carefully versus something more centralized uh, where you can go faster. So that's a real trade-off, and I think we'll see blockchains around that, 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 that spectrum, but I don't think the other ones really are. And so since they're not trade-offs, I, I think one system will end up absorbing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the rest. So I don't think interoperability is as important uh, as it's made out to be. So I'm, I'm really interested in like two, um, two very interesting ideas you put forward in, in what you said. The first was you made a statement like uh, you weren't that interested in disintermediation itself, but in, in making intermediate intermediation permissionless. Did I state that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so, Let's let's go into that concept a little, little bit more. Um, what does it mean in depth? Could you could you restate the concept or like sketch out a vision for what it means for intermediation to be? Yeah, and, and I, should, I should state that I have you know I have many ideas about this space, and some of them I hold very very strongly. This is one of the more speculative one. I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm not as sure about that one as I would be about uh, about other things. So the general, you know, there's a general concept in economics that what you should worry about is not a monopoly, but really uh, not a de facto monopoly, but really freedom of entry, right? If you have a monopoly, but any company could come in and compete, it doesn't matter if they actually compete. What matters is that they can come in. And so the problem with financial intermediation is perhaps that there's so few intermediaries. If you have very, very high barrier to entry in uh, financial intermediation, then you're going to have lower quality of service, higher prices, uh, perhaps less trust. Whereas if anyone can participate, you have more competition, and so possibly you have uh, better service. So that's one um, that's one point of view. Uh, but it, there is something to be said about the fact that blockchains and cryptocurrencies, for the first time, they allow long distance payment without intermediation. That's never happened in, in the history of humanity. So, you know, I would not I would not be too quick to just take that and say like, oh, that doesn't matter. Uh, that's certainly something that's important. But I also I also think that being able to have a lot of different, uh, a lot of different centralized parties bloom and participate in a network of operation is, uh, is, is very helpful. In fact, if you look at uh, Lightning, uh, Lightning, Lightning Network, some people of the Lightning Network say, oh, it's centralized. Look, it has to have all these ups and spokes and so on and so forth. Yeah, but you have freedom of entry. I don't have to use your Lightning node if I don't want to. I can, I can make a direct blockchain transaction. I can fall back on some other node. You have the freedom of choice. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters. And so as a result, I'm, I'm less concerned about the on-chain uh, transaction throughput uh, by itself. I see basically what happens on-chain as a fallback 
for a flurry of activity that happens off chain. The second interesting concept is um, like you expressed like some kind of skepticism about the value proposition of decentralized applications in terms of their product market fit. And on the other side, like so decentralized applications, what are they? Well, there's an there's I tend to think of them as like applications that do not have a single individual like service provider or central server that's like serving that application. It's like a network of nodes that's serving that application. Mm -hmm. And so you express like skepticism on the product market fit of decentralized applications, but you you yourself built a smart contract chain. What's the value proposition of smart contracts if not decentralized applications? So I think there's a people are starting to make a difference between, and it's not that there's a fundamental difference, but it, you know there's a spectrum. But we when people call it DAP and what people call a smart contract. So I I I heard about this DAP recently. Is that I, I don't know the name and I don't want to point any finger, but it's a DAP that lets you, you know, you take some video and then it will encode the video for you. And there's a decentralized network of people who can encode your video and so on and so forth. And you know that's fine. That's life peer. I'm not. I'm not sold on the idea that uh, that you need to do this through a decentralized network as opposed to uh, to a uh, as opposed to like facing a centralized website that gives you that service. And maybe I don't understand it. Okay, that that that, that, that can be. I just uh, I I don't see it directly. On the other hand of the spectrum, you have something like a a multi sig contract. That's a smart contract, but no one would take a look at a multi sig and call it a DAP. Okay, so this is a smart contract because you want to make things like multi-sig contracts, because if you have a smart contract language, implementing something like the Radian network is a lot more trivial than implementing something like the Lightning network. There was this comment on Twitter recently I, that I thought it was really spot on. It was like something that's a paper in Bitcoin is like a blog post <laughs> in Ethereum, just because of the simplicity of having a smart contract language. So it's making it easier for people to write uh, contracts like insurance contracts. Or, well, I think yeah. I think uh, to put it succinctly, um, Arthur thinks that you know smart contracts are a bad name for smart contracts, and one thing he'd prefer is automated escrow. Um, so that gives you an idea of the amount of expressivity that he'd like to see in in these sorts of um, pieces of code. So, yeah, that's right. The idea of automated escrow is that look, you have some tokens which are like stuck in the smart contract. And you want to release a certain sum to certain parties depending on certain conditions. Uh, it's not, I, I don't say it as a subject to just run uh, a, a full fledged uh, application. But, you know, or, or uh, so yeah, automated disk also alludes to the idea of, you know, just go to the blockchain for adjudication. You know, you were running an option contract, you had a dispute, you go to the chain, and then you verify uh, you verify what happened. So that's, that's mostly the use case I, I, I see for it. That being said, again, I, I, I try not, if, if I don't need to have a very strong conviction in something, uh, I won't. And so ov obviously I want Tezos to be a platform that accommodates all kinds of applications, including uh, including dApps, if dApps want to use uh, uh, Tezos. Like I said, there's not a whole lot of trade-offs. So maybe maybe throughput is a trade-off, and that's one I would uh, personally favor less than decentralization. But it's, um, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, it, the protocol is in the hand of the uh, of the community, and so if they decide to push it in a direction that's more towards throughput and dApps, that's uh, what will happen. That's my personal preference. Yeah, no, this is a fascinating answer. Now, I, I'm. Do you think it, would it be fair to say that one way to think about Tezos is it's like Bitcoin, but there's governance, there are some smart contracts, and there's proof of stake instead of proof of work. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could, you, 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 you could, you could say that. And because, because one of the interesting question, of course, is, is if you, you had, if you look at Ethereum and if you looked at the Ethereum, basically pitch that Ethereum made back in when they did the, the fundraiser and afterwards it was okay. Ethereum is this world computer and you can run any kind of application on Ethereum and then it's trustless and in Ethereum, the token or Ether, the token is gas to pay for computation on this thing, right? So it was also from, from a token perspective, seen as a very different thing from Bitcoin, which may be this money. Um, so do you, do you think when you look at thesis, do you see those more in the kind of money camp than in the gas camp? Or how do you look at that? Yeah, it's interesting. When, when uh, Ethereum came up with that, uh, that pitch, I thought they were being Strossian, you know, I thought they were they were saying, of course, it's a cryptocurrency, 
But if we say that we're competing head on with Bitcoin, people are not going to take us seriously. So we're going to find a differentiator, say that Bitcoin is gold and say that we're gas and that way people will see value. And then we can establish ourselves as a cryptocurrency. That's how I that, that's, that's what I thought was going on, because in my mind, it was clearly a cryptocurrency. Uh, but no, I think they meant it. Uh, now I, I know things they meant it. For me, I mean, these things are primarily useful as money. And so I, I see it as a cryptocurrency. But that being said, I don't think you have to be in the uh, in the application camp or the money camp or, or it, it's worse. People tend to cluster is like, OK, well, you have privacy coins and then you have money coins and then you have application. Coins. Hang on. Like I said, not a whole lot of trade offs. There's no reason why you can't have privacy. You can't be money and you can also be used to power uh, gas and smart contract. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, if you know, it's not like physical gas. It's not like you have gas and then you have to break down the molecules. You're just paying, you know, you're, you're paying uh, miners or bakers to include your transactions. And if you're going to be paying them, you're essentially using money. So it's money that's used for a certain type of application. And the best money is the money that you can use for the most uh, type of use cases. And so, you know, be it gas, be it payments, being everything that you can think of. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise-grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. Recently, uh, the guys from Multicoin, they've had some interesting uh, thesis around that. And one of the things they've argued is that the things that will succeed as a store of value, and I think that very much ties into what you're saying, are, are the things that will have the most usage and basically the kind of smart contract or application platform that, that succeeds at the biggest scales, like whatever token belongs to that platform is also going to become um, the, you know, the most valuable store of value. Does that kind of tie into? Yeah, yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that thesis. Although I think that they are very, very, str there's very strong history of this. And so just by virtue of being the first Bitcoin as a very massive lead uh, and, and, and it's not clear that being able to be used for smart contracts is enough of a benefit to uh, to change a shelling point in people's mind that you know Bitcoin is it and so that's that's really, really a, a, an uphill battle for any uh, any cryptocurrency out there including for Tezos yeah including for Tezos of course okay, okay. more more so for Tezos than Ethereum because yeah. Tezos is new to the game yep very interesting so so in a sense, like Ethereum tried to create at least like publicly this different market of a world computer and this asset as gas in that world computer. Whereas your perspective is like all the cryptocurrencies are ultimately stores of value. They are all they all compete with each other, including Tezos. Pretty much, and I and I think that most of the DApp cryptocurrencies, even though they ha are being used as store of uh, a store of value. Because they basically have given have gotten a money like characteristic. They're scarce. People are using them as uh, as money and a store of values uh, more than uh, more than anything. But 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 there's there's conversions in uh, in, uh, in 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 money, and I think you you end up having the most liquid one or the most useful one be the one that dominates. Yeah, and I mean part of the reason that there's a conversation around this that that talks about it as like an app for one thing is because you don't want to say like yeah, I'm competing with Bitcoin and I'm competing with Ethereum because there's a lot of entrenched players and entrenched um interests and you don't want to go head to head with it. You want to say like no, you know no, I'm not competing with Ethereum because you see I will be the application for dog walking on the blockchain and so you can't say that I'm competing with so and so. Um so I think more you know, for being intellectually honest, 
um, we're all kind of operating in the same space is just very few people want to admit it because it, in, it invites a lot of vitriol um, towards you uh, the second you start to say this. Yeah, but there are people who know that these things are competing. It's crypto Twitter. Crypto Twitter is pretty bad. But if you look at it, and the reason you see so much animosity, I think, is because deep down people know that these things are competing against yeah. each other. Well, yeah. <laughs> that and a lot of time on their hands, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, just because you're competing doesn't mean that it has to be like a, a like a, a ferocious, like an ugly, an ugly battle. I think right now, uh, I, think, I I don't want to steal your quotes. Oh well, it's not my quote. It's Paul Graham. No, but I, I always, oh, well, I, I think uh, people overstate the amount of animosity between different project uh, leads. Um, I think Arthur and I have a pretty good working relationship with a lot of people who work in this space who might be considered our competitors, um, because as I like to say, but I appropriated from Paul Graham. Um, you know, a, a startup doesn't usually compete against um, other startups. It usually competes against people not giving a shit about it. So, um, that's really, even more true about blockchain protocols. Even more true about blockchain <laughs> protocols, because really, like, if you look at the amount of people who actually use this in their day to day, it's it's actually quite meager um, compared to the amount of hypes and headline headlines that have been um, circulated around this. So, really, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, you know, relevancy for one blockchain uh, helps out all the others. Um, it's, it's not, you know, it's not crazy to, to posit that, um, helping out one project become relevant, um, you know, helps the others. And so, yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I, I, I watched on TV a couple, uh, like this, um, this TV, there was a TV show series for Highlander and it was always weird to me when he had a friend who was also a Highlander and I was like, but. Are they going to have to like kill each other down the line at some point? Why are they friends? You know, <laughs> for anyone who was born after 1990, um, what Arthur means to say is like, well, Highlander, there can only be one. Um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but you know, he it's makes far friends down, along the way. It's far, it's far down <laughs> uh, the line. Yeah, exactly. So like, you know, we'll we'll like pull out knives when <laughs> when uh, all of these things have have become the way that you pay for coffee in Dubai and uh, and and I don't know Frankfurt respectively but, but what, if, what if the real casual teaser is a friend who made it along the way yeah I don't think so <laughs> anyway <laughs> um, you know the point is like we have so far to go in terms of realizing the uh, you know promises of this technology that it's really not worth um, trying to take out other people or malign others um, at this at this juncture so that that's a very interesting perspective and like i i'm like tempted to contrast it to a lot of different projects in this space like the clearest contrast to me comes out with definity right like so a project that's trying to build like you know like facebook on the blockchain or gmail on the blockchain whereas like in tezos like at least not tezos but you yourself uh, as founders of it ideologically uh, believe in a very different direction for the for the cryptocurrency space so yeah <laughs> look at the end of the day if everyone if you know definity comes out and everyone starts building all these applications on definity and it becomes clear and everyone starts using them and it's great and everyone loves them you know at this point i'm like okay then i, I guess we need i guess we need to have throughputs uh you know, the, the main thing to know about Tezos is that it's an evolvable system uh which which is really designed to favor innovation and evolvability uh, I, I I think the, uh, the there's a lot of ideas in the uh, uh, Definity consensus which are really interesting. Um, the idea of doing uh, like sortition, but like a, a Bayesian agree agreement with sortition using a threshold signature for getting your randomness. All of that are really good ideas. Uh, but uh, you know I do expect that at some point their code will be open source. They will release their papers. Uh, I'm more uh, like the, the part right now that that, that that strikes me as a little uh, difficult is the whole. Um, distributed key generation but look the you know the i, I think the ideas in the consensus are really good and if they're uh, if they're good there's no reason for tezos not to adopt them if there's demand for it so let's switch to a different topic now uh, the topic is of course like the tezos foundation drama we need to cover it even <laughs> for, for custom sake i guess um uh so so like yeah, tezos broke out in the in the media and in the crypto narrative because of the Tezos Foundation drama, it attracted a lot of attention. So could you just like walk us through what really happened uh, in this episode and, and maybe some of your learnings from it? Away. Well, you know, basically like Johan Gevers was called self-dealing and so he fabricated a scandal with the help of Reuters in order to create ambiguity 
Uh, and also he had like a lot of contacts in the crypto valleys that he leveraged to protect himself. And so, you know, what should have been a fairly uh, straightforward removal of a uh, board member who committed improprieties turned into, was made into a scandal by Reuters who was trying to sell copy. Uh, but thankfully, <laughs> um, you know, an outlet that has far more subscribers and much more page views, <laughs> Wired, actually took the effort to find out both sides of the, you know, so-called scandal. And uh, quickly it became obvious that, um, you know, Arthur and I were quite wronged <laughs> by this um, man and his uh, accomplice, Guido Schmitz Krumaka. And uh, yeah, I mean, also it ends well. Like, uh, thankfully, Tezos was in such a good place that, um, you know, the network was able to ship uh, relatively on time. And, uh, you know, no harm, no foul. I mean, if the Swiss really want to live up to the expectations that they set for everyone who they give tours of the Crypto Valley to, um, perhaps they'll prosecute Johan Gevers for, um, you know, disloyal management, much like they did, uh, you know, the folks at FIFA. I think this is in the same ballpark of, of malfeasance. Um, but yeah, like we don't spend that much time thinking about what a South African masseuse thinks. Um, so why should you? <laughs> One of the interesting uh, parts of like at least the occurrence of events as I saw it is um, so you had like three board members. So Johan Gavers, Guido schwitz and then there was Diego Pons. So the Diego, as I understand it, was always uh, very supportive of uh, of the two of you. I think well, he was Diego, the... su- yeah, Diego supported the technology because he understands it. That's you know a first <laughs> asset. Um, Diego's also not a fucking crook, so that helps. <laughs> so yeah, you know Diego had a bit of an up on the two of them, but nonetheless, he he still had a backbone. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think the man should um, like remarkable resilience. And yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's like the board had a two out of three failure uh, because I think because of the concentration in a crypto valley. So like the board had a two out of three failure. And I actually thought like your hand, Diego's hand was just too weak because like it was almost that like Johan and um, and Guido had had you cornered in some sense. That is that is the impression I got. But then things suddenly turned around and like the situation solved. How, how, how and why did Johan did give up control? Well, there's a few things going on here. First of all, Johan is a terrible tactician. <laughs> um, yeah, but look, we, we, without just spending too much time on this, yeah. I think essentially what happened is that, um, you know, he gives this very weird talk uh, in January at the crypto, uh, at the crypto conference, you know, with large quotes of himself. And the community, which had been misled by Reuters into thinking this was a dispute, and like he said, they say they were like, okay, no, this guy is nuts, and he was obviously nuts, and Reuters knew that, you know, they they they, they did this on purpose. Uh, and so, you know, once that tilted, the community really threw their support behind an, is- an initiative that also came from the community called the T2 Foundation. And when it became clear that the T2 Foundation was actually going to be the one uh, releasing the protocol, uh, I think it forced the hand. Of uh, I think it forced the hand of the first foundation who had to uh, who had to basically understand that it, you know they would th- their position was becoming untenable. I mean, basically, let's face it. Uh, you know, all of Tezos um, broadly construed, those who want to see the protocol in the wild are very freaking lucky that their arch nemeses were Anna Herrera, Steve Secklow, <laughs> Brennan Hughes Narari, <laughs> Johan Gevers, and Guido Schmitz Krumacher. They were that not exactly like, the A team. Yeah, they're not exactly the A team. <laughs> like we were dealing with a pretty weak hand on the other side. So even though they had a billion dollars and all of the narrative that they wanted to do to... to and an international press publication really to publish anything they would say. Literally anything they would say. They still managed to fail because guess what? Soft power prevails and the narrative around Tezos is not that of enriching a, um, a, a South African masseuse, but rather... Uh, uh, launching a decentralized network. Launching a decentralized network, network with the power of you know, 30,000 wilds. So, I mean, really, <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to stand on my laurels because this is a pretty easy thing to trounce. Um, but the, the sort of soft narrative around Tezos was really not in favor of them ever having any clout whatsoever. I mean, even the mere suggestion that Tezos would never launch, which is what Reuters tried to write twice, um, once in September because they didn't understand what a put option was. And the second time, uh, you know, when this whole governance crisis came through, 
Um, the, the whole suggestion was that Tezos would never launch, even though there were 40,000 lines of code that have been running on a testnet for over Six, almost a year. 60, but you know. It's like, yeah, still, like, yeah. There's like, no, there's, the there, technical literacy that is. There's no one technical who would yeah, look at Tezos exactly. and say this thing would not shape. Yeah, it's just like, it's annoying in, in the short term, at but the it's end of the day, in the long term. I don't know if it was malice on their part and just, you know, wanting to like knock an ICO down or like, you know, one of those things, or if it was just like pure incompetence, but, you know, the end result was basically the same, and I think they made a complete fool out of themselves. I mean, the horror stories around Anna alone are just worth warranting, you know, its that's, own examination. That's for but, another time. Yeah, that's another time. But in any case, like, it's not worth it's not worth dwelling on folks who can never, like, compile the code around Tezos to talk about how, uh, to talk about how, like, you know, they made a kind of a kerfuffle around this. So, of course, it's always tricky to abstract from, you know, this particular story. But still, do you have some some kind of lessons that you take away either for you, you know, that apply to, I don't know, business or working in general, or maybe that's specific to people starting uh, blockchain projects and foundations? Or what are kind of your main takeaways here? I mean, there's, a, there's often a tendency to overgeneralize uh, life lessons, and sometimes, you know, they're just... They're just narrow accidents, but I think the most useful generalization I can give to, would give would teach not to do business in the crypto valley. I think they value their image a lot more than they value integrity, and I I don't think it's a good place to uh, to do business. They try to be uh, to be very very attractive of the things, but at the end of the day, uh, they haven't really attracted uh, enough uh, the technical talents, like not a critical mass, and yeah, they're, they you know they haven't been reliable when when uh, when Tezos suffered they were nowhere to be found and, or, or to help. Well, I mean, what's more, you know, when when the whole Gevers fiasco kind of came into play, um, we were told by many people who were more than happy to say nice things about Johan prior to um, us, you know, going to this contract with the Tezos Foundation, oh yeah, Johan's a great guy. Um, but pretty much in October, everyone was like, yeah, no one likes that dude. And we're like, when were you going to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it kind of spans the gambit from from uh, regulatory officials to to people who worked for Monitas, um, who actually contributed yeah. to the Tezos fundraiser. What we witnessed overall was a lot of cowardice. Yeah, a lot of cowardice. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I just would never do business there. Um, anymore. Anymore. Yeah. Um, another thing is, uh, you know... Well, I guess no, that's, 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 that's my takeaway, actually. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's just uh, just that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. And so, is the, are there ideas of moving some of the Tezos Foundation out of of there as well? I mean, I know, for example, Ethereum, they have shifted some activities to Singapore, although I guess the foundation's still there. So I'm not totally sure to what extent, but um, ha is, or is this that something Tesla's Foundation is there and, and has to stay there? You should have them, I'm not sure to ask the question. But I know that there are other foundations around the world which are active, like uh, Tesla's Korea, Tesla's Japan, uh, TCF in the US. So there are, uh, there are a few other foundations. I don't know what the uh, Tesla's Foundation intends to do. Yeah. Have you ever considered that one of the biggest factors holding back growth in the blockchain industry is the lack of talented available developers? By some estimates, there are up to 14 job openings for every single blockchain developer in the world. That's where TopTal comes in. TopTal is a global network of talent in business, technology, and design, and they pick their members by selecting only the top 3% of applicants. When you work with TopTal, you're getting the creme de la creme. They've got a blockchain specialization that's an on-demand service that connects your business to an elite network of developers and engineers specializing in areas like Solidity, Smart Contracts, Hyperledger Fabric, R3 Corda, decentralized applications, and more. What's best about TopTal, what I like the most about this service, is they take the stress and pain out of hiring. Who has time to publish job openings and sift through resumes and schedule interviews and all that stuff? It's a white glove service, so they take care of everything. And a TopTal director of engineering will deliver the best candidates for your position on a silver platter in as fast as 24 hours. And from there, your company can work with your new hire for a no-risk trial period and you pay only if you're satisfied. So simplify your hiring process and access the world's best blockchain talent. For a limited time, Epicenter listeners are eligible for a $1,000 credit after the first $2,000 paid towards their first hire. To learn more, go to toptal.com slash epicenter. And we'd like to thank TopTal for their support. So recently, like Tezos launched its main net, right? And um, tell us how, the, how, that, how that experience has been and how the main net has shaped up. Uh, I think the experience was rather, uh, the word that's been mostly used was smooth. 
uh, in a sense that, you know, it worked. I think the longest it's, the longer the network was unavailable was uh, maybe for, you know, there were periods of like one hour, I think, twice where no blocks were produced. And yeah, no, it's, it, it's been about it. What was really great was to see how quickly uh, bakers took off. So one of the things that worried me at first was um, the, you know, before the launch, it was not a big ecosystem of, uh, of bakers uh, that had been uh, developed. But as soon as it happened, uh, there were 20 and then there were 50 and then 100 uh, bakers on the system. Right now, there's 400 uh, addresses which are uh, registered to bake. Um, there's about 100 that are actively baking. And so that really, really um, took off very quickly. And so on the technical side, things were smooth. And on uh, the baking side, we had a lot of decentralization very, very early on with a lot of people getting into the network. So I think that's been, uh, th that's been fantastic. And I think that, you know, the launch... When um, the way that the Tales Foundation communicated around the launch was uh, a little uh, low key, uh, I think in contrast with uh, some launches, you know, which are yes. I, I like to say Beyonce inspired, but uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> we just dropped the mic, uh, <laughs> album out now. Anyway, um, yeah, but you know what? This environment does not really like counter signaling. They're like you know, you see a lot of people who are like, whoa, why didn't you do a party with a pop star for your launch? You well, know, because it's a technological project. Yeah. Well, I think people like the comfort of looking like other things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more like, it's not about, oh, we actually want to see Snoop Dogg play. It's about, <laughs> we want the assurance that you're just like the other projects that invited Snoop Dogg to play. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's there's a whole psychology to be written about this um, very weird milieu in, in technology. Uh, uh, Malcolm Demirs had a, had a talk about... Uh, the shitcoin waterfall and in it she had like fake hearthstone cards and yeah, it's pretty the, funny. the game where you play and then you know, like, <laughs> like you play partnership and it's like yeah you play launch party and you know that's something you play and obviously it gives more value because we all agree that it does and, yeah you know, but it costs a, a lot of mana the, 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 <laughs> that costs a lot of uh, um yeah it's of mana and and but i think these things are transient at the end you know at the end of the day uh having something that's robust that's secure that's useful uh is what ends up prevailing yeah, I would love to dive into a little bit how Tesla's proof of stake works because I remember reading about this before it launched and, and kind of the description and I felt it was, was quite interesting and unusual and it was a little bit... So yeah, maybe you can speak about that. So right, so yeah, you you have... Bob, it was a little... Yeah, but uh, no, I, I was I was somewhat skeptical, but I feel I, I totally agree with you. It's been interesting to watch the, the baking ecosystem evolve and I think it seems to work out pretty well so far. So can you can you talk around how, you know, maybe the role of bakers, delegators, roles, uh, endorsements, and like how how kind of this uh, baker community together works on validating transactions and producing blocks? Yeah, and so one of the things that you need to separate in the algorithm is first, what is your kind of consensus pool? Like, you know, who's, who's really taking part of your consensus in which proportion, and then how do you reach consensus? Uh, so the first part, you know, who's your consensus pool? So it's based on proof of stake idea, and one of the one of the design goal of Tezos um, is that even if you have a very very small stake, uh, you can still have a very very small influence on uh, on the blocks. Yes, yeah, the idea being like if you have zero point one percent of the network, you should be able to create zero point one percent of the blocks. That's one property that I wanted to uh, that that I like about Tezos that you don't have uh, in. Uh, uh, in systems, for example, like the boss. So I wanted to preserve that property, but you also need to have some form of delegation um, because a lot of people are not necessarily going to be online or not going to uh, run machines. So there's the idea of this optional delegation model where you can uh, uh, make, you know, bake yourself, create blocks yourself, or you can give that right to another key, uh, which can be controlled by a different machine, by someone else, by a consortium. So you have a, a wide variety of options. And then, so, you know, when, once you do that, you have this idea of uh, saying, okay, so now you have different, these different keys, which you can create blocks, and they all have different balances. You add a uh, coin tracking mechanism to it. It's a technique known for the Satoshi. The main benefits of it is that if you have a, uh, a fork, like not a hard fork, like more like a, a, another branch, uh, someone cannot shuffle the coin around and make it look like they own a larger stake than they do. You will see that only a small fraction of the coins are... Uh, are, are, are participating in the consensus because you can't just move your coin between two different addresses. The system is going to track them. So it's tracked, but to be efficient, it's tracked at, uh, at an aggregate, which is a roll level, which is about 10,000 tokens. 
So at the, at the end of the day, what it boils down to is you have these different delegates or people participating directly, and they have a, a stake which is rounded down to the nearest multiple of 10,000. So since there's about 800 million um, uh, coins in total, that means that you have up to 80,000 rolls. So now you have 80, these 80,000 rolls. How do you do consensus? Right. You could say, well, I'm going to do a Byzantine agreement on 80,000, but you know that's too much. So it's a chain-based algorithm uh, which proceeds in epoch. Uh, one epoch is 4,096 uh, 4, slots. And in each slot, you have a random priority. So it's your turn to create a block. And then the next turn, it's someone else's turn to create a block and so on and so forth. And in order to converge uh, faster, in order to, so not, it's not like having finality. It's more like trying to be, uh, you, you try to be a chain-based algorithm, a kind of like optimistic BFT in the sense of like, instead of trying to get everyone's agreement, you try to uh, get people to agree and then you just count how many people agree. Uh, and if a lot of people agree, then it's probably going to uh, to converge. So we have a mechanism of endorsements where after each block, you have 32 random stakeholders who can come in and sign and add their uh, add their signature to the to the block. So the main benef the you know the main benefits of uh, of doing that is that if uh, if the network is really active and is really live, then you'll get a lot of endorsements, which means there's a large fraction of the stakes that's involved in validating the chain, and so you need only a few confirmations in order for uh, for, for you to be confident that there's not going to be reversions. And if the network is not working as well, you'll get few endorsements and then you'll wait a little uh, longer to get your uh, new confirmations. So that's basically the algorithm. I think, um, you know, uh, the closest uh, other algorithm that I can think of in this space would be Ouroboros, which is, uh, would uh, turn out to be uh, very, very similar to uh, to the algorithm for Tezos with uh, the difference that it doesn't have the, uh, the endorsement uh, aspect but you know it does have the benefits of uh, being simple enough that you can do a full uh, mathematical treatment of it, which is nice because you can actually prove uh, properties about it. Whereas in Tezos, and that's maybe one of the things you were uh, alluding to when you were shaking your head a little bit, you have more um, heuristic arguments of uh, of safety. Yeah, because one of the things with with many, like let's say if you look at the example of like Tendermint, or I think in Definity is a similar way, right? In that you have like let's say in Tenement, right, you need two thirds of the stake to sign off on each block. And so you have this finality and you also have this guarantee that, okay, as long as less than one third is malicious, you know, the chain progresses and every block, you know, there can't be like forks and stuff like that. So here you, you don't have that, but of course, at the same time, you, you have this probabilistic characteristic that, you know, maybe you sort of implicitly have that because you would have to get extremely, extremely unlucky to have, you know, a bunch of malicious entities being chosen as block proposals in a row. Or how do you look at that kind of resilience to a, a group of malicious bakers? So the way you analyze it, short of being able to do full mathematical treatment, is mostly simulation. So, um, and, and, and that's what I refer to when I'm in the, um, the heuristic argument. So you simulate a system where you have, for example, 10% of the stakes that's not doing anything, 50% uh, of the stakes that's uh, participating and maybe 40% that's malicious. And then when you, what you try to do as a malicious participant is you try to say, okay, um, let's say that I want to revert a transaction in a specific block. So I can start earlier and I can add later. Uh, how often am I going to get a series of cre block creation rights and endorsements that will let me create a chain with more weight than the other chain? So you know, how often uh, is it that I can make, uh, that I can uh, catch up to a chain which has a hundred uh, endorsements, and if you you know if you uh, do want to call a sampling of that long enough, you get you know you get a, you um, you get some indication of how fast these uh, um, these things decay. And having endorsements make it decay a lot faster than if, than if you don't have endorsements. Okay, so but you basically have this characteristic that uh, a little bit like similar to Bitcoin, maybe that right you have this longest chain. And it starts becoming very unlikely that somebody can create a longer chain. It's not longest yeah. chain. It's it's total number of endorsements. That's the weight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's like it's 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 like chain, but with this yeah added endorsement. I mean, endorsement is purely a subjective thing that you know. Let's say I as an exchange will take into account if you send if you deposit some thesis on the exchange, and I might say, okay, what are the endorsements currently in the chain, and how many transactions do I need or confirmations to I need until I say I credit your account. You, you don't count confirmations in blocks, ideally you count confirmations in endorsements. 
And right right now, I think the recommendation is wait 30 blocks because there's still some uh, there's still better numbers which are pending, which are based on uh, on confirmation. In practice, I think yeah, given that every block has like 32 confirmations, I think in practice after a couple of blocks, uh, you're probably uh, you're probably fine. But uh, you know, waiting for these, uh, I think it's important to wait for these uh, uh, these numbers. So uh, both Brian and I uh, have spent significant part of this year working to build a validator for the Cosmos network. And in the Cosmos network, that's also proof of stake. But Cosmos has, um, has the property that when a block is produced with a set of transactions in it and a set of greater than 66% of the validator set signs off on that block. And if I'm a user and my transaction is in a block like that, when I see that single block, I can be like, okay, my transaction is confirmed and it can it cannot be reversed, right? So there's a, like this block finality at the point uh, the block is produced actually. Yeah. Does Tezos have something like that or do I as a user need to wait a few blocks, many blocks before considering my transaction final? No, yeah, you have to wait a few, uh, uh, a few blocks. So basically the idea of something, a uh, finality in something like Cosmos is that we're going to get until uh, everyone, and not everyone is too certain, but like a, a sufficiently large fraction uh, of, of, of everyone agrees on everything and they're not going to, you know, and they're not going to agree until they agree. So potentially it can, potentially sometimes it can take longer for them to agree, but once they agree, you know that it's not going to move. Whereas here you'll get some of the, like a tentative agreements. They're like, well, you know, it looks like they're starting to agree and then you'll wait a few blocks. But the thing is, it's like, you know, what's the difference between finality and something like a 10 to the minus nine probability of reversion if you wait for a certain number of blocks. So for me, I, I, I don't see the finality as opposed to waiting for a few blocks to be that big of a, that big of a deal. What does seem more important to me uh, and to the benefit of Cosmos is that Tendermint is a, um, so, so, you know, uh, Bitcoin uh, or Tezos, they're both synchronous protocol. Whereas you can do partial synchrony uh, with something like Tendermint, which means essentially that in Tendermint you can afford to go as fast as you want, and then maybe you won't get to go that fast because maybe you'll have network delays or attackers that delay. So maybe you'll take longer to reach your uh, consensus, but there's no harm in trying to try and get it very very fast. Whereas in in Bitcoin, for example, you have to set 10 minutes between blocks because you don't really know how much an attacker can delay blocks, and so you have to kind of like set this high conservative value. It would be nice to say, like, I don't know what the delays are, but so I'm going to try to go as fast as possible. And then if there are delays, I'll go slower. But if there are no delays, I'll go fast. So to me, that's one of the main, uh, you know, the, the uh, not being fully synchronous, I think, is one of the main benefits uh, of these approaches. And, and for that, you need something like a, like a, like a Byzantine agreement. I mean, I've been thinking of different chain-based algorithm. And so one possibility is if you notice that you're missing some slots, so for example, uh, a block that was supposed, the first block that was supposed to be produced is not produced, and so now you have like the second priority. So if you notice that, you could increase the times. You could say, "Ha, huh, you know what? I'm missing some blocks. Maybe they're being delayed by an adversary, so I'm going to wait longer." So you could do that, and it's funny because if you do that, then you're you know you're, you're you know, you become safer against attacks, but at the same time you start slowing down uh, more when there are attacks, and so you can think of it as a continuum. Uh, between safety and liveness, like you know, you can get slug, you can get more sluggish and more sluggish, but still have liveness and have more safety. So there's really a uh, continuum between the two. Now that being said, I think that when Bitcoin came around, so the, the two reasons for doing something like uh, like a chain-based algorithm is, I think when uh, when Bitcoin came around, there was this idea that people would just like open their laptop or their computer and participate and go online and go offline. You don't really know who's going to be online or offline. Whereas quickly this thing has become professionalized. Uh, all the mining pools are professional. Uh, most of the bakers on, on, on Tezos are professional or semi-professional. And so since you, since these people are going to be available anyway, the risk of the risk of not of not being able to find two third is actually I think lower than what was anticipated when when Bitcoin was designed. Well, yeah, it was a main argument for Bitcoin. It was like anyone could participate in the mining process and get them involved, and quickly it's becoming not the case. Um, yeah, so I, I I don't know how much of um I, I I'm I'm generally wondering how much of uh, how, how much are you losing when you're doing finality on every block, and then the other problem is say well okay, but what if I have you know eighty thousand rolls 
I don't want to just like select the top 100 because I don't want to be, I, I, you know, I want the person who has 0.1% to do 0.1% of the blocks. But on the other hand, I don't, uh, you know, I, I can't do Byzantine agreement at this scale because it's just like way too many. And then you get into stuff like Affinity where you, uh, where you just like randomly select uh, 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 like a, a large enough sample and then you do Byzantine agreement between them. Uh, it seems to be a matter of taste. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, I think everyone's kind of overbuilding for the uh, for the demand right now in terms of consensus and throughput. So there's a lot of really cool science uh, and engineering that's being done all around. Uh, I think it'll, it'll it'll come down to what applications actually need. Well, I, I think that is a main uh, a main differentiator for Tezos, though, is like this idea of inclusivity um, for anyone who wants to participate in in the algorithm, but. I think we're getting a little off topic if we go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, no, absolutely. Tezos is uh, Tezos is not married to so his consensus algorithm. Nope. You know, they're <laughs> they're, uh, they're dating, and he and, and and Tezos has a wandering eye. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, like Tezos can change the consensus algorithm, um, but is that something that you will actively pursue? And if 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 so, are there particularly attractive targets that you want to evaluate? Uh, I so like I said, there's, there's two parts to the consensus algorithm. You know, the first is like how you select your your quorum, and so the role and delegation model in Tezos, the uh, LPOS model, I think is 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 pretty good, and that thing is uh that thing is rather solid. Uh, what you could improve though is uh the lag between uh you uh delegating tokens and then uh, having creation rights. A lot of these lags are um, created for security and for randomness generation. So if you can improve these things, you can reduce this lag. Uh, yeah, no, I definitely uh, I'm interested in improving the Tezos um, consensus algorithm. I'm, you know, reading the literature uh, when it comes out, thinking about it. I think the first the first order of business is uh, is improving what already exists in Tezos. I think the randomness generation is an easy way to improve it. Uh, you know, uh, using uh, also uh, a trick used in uh, in several projects is to do uh, PVSS in order to generate randomness. So we have that uh, in a branch, but it's not in the main. Uh, it's not in the main branch. So adding that would probably be uh, be a good addition. I think the block time could be uh, reduced a lot for the first slot. So maybe you know you get like you can you get your first slot within ten seconds, but then the second slot takes a minute. So that way you get to have a block every ten seconds when everything goes uh, uh, goes well. And if there's some delays, you still have it's still very forgiving uh, before someone else can start stealing uh, stealing slots. So uh, improve, you know, once we get uh, better simulation, better formalization of the consensus algorithm, we'll be able to uh, to tweak it uh, and get a bit of performance out of it, and then start evaluating uh, what's out there and what's uh, what's the best bet for uh, for Tezos. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of projects with a lot of big big claims coming up, and uh, proof is in the pudding. It's really hard to execute, um, but we keep a close eye on them. Yeah, but I I'll say that I really like. Uh, so I really like Tendermint uh, as an algorithm. I, you know, one one compliment I've made before is that you know they made consensus boring, uh, in a sense of like it's really classical. Uh, it's a really classical method, but at the end of the day, you get so much better properties. And there's a lot of really uh, weird and cool science being done in chain-based algorithms. But at the end of the day, what are you really buying? You know, when you're doing a chain-based algorithm. So I think that's really cool. Uh, doing sortition uh, 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 in. Uh, Doing sortition in, uh, in Tendermint, uh, like Definity is doing, is really cool. I don't think you necessarily need to do it with threshold uh, cryptography. You could be using something like PVSS to slowly uh, generate randomness and do that. So I think that would be a, a fairly easy path to uh, to take. I, I think that's a fairly uh, that's a fairly straightforward well, thing to do. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so that's like one axis, which is like the the consensus part of it. But then the other part is like um, adding privacy preserving transactions to the um, network and, and the sort of implications of that on, on, uh, right. Um, oh yeah. I mean, in term, yeah. In, in terms of, once you start having, um, privacy preserving transactions and when, when some of the stake becomes private, it, be, it, it gets a little trickier to, uh, to let people have their stake private and participate in the, uh, in the consensus algorithm because you want people to leave their stake inside the commitment tree, uh, so that you have a bigger anonymity set. And, but you, other, 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 but so, so these people should be getting, uh, Baking rights, but it complicates uh, complicates matter quite uh, quite a bit. So that's an interesting aspect as well. So y you both just mentioned uh, privacy preserving transactions in Tezos, but I didn't fully understand uh, what exactly 
that means and what context they would be used there. So do you mind expanding a bit on, on what ideas you have in that direction? Yeah, so, you know, at the end of the day, what cryptocurrencies are trying to do is e-cash, right? So most of the money today is electronic, but it's in a, in, it's, it's in a banking system. Uh, and so it means that if you want to use electronic payments, uh, you're gonna, you have to go through intermediaries, uh, you have surveillance, you have censorship, you have all of these things, whereas in cash you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of privacy, you have a lot of freedom. So can we get cash with it electronically? You know, right? That's been the dream. And one aspect of cash that's really not replicated by Bitcoin or Tezos or Ethereum, for that matter, is the privacy aspect. You know, you're it's kind of the opposite of privacy. You're broadcasting uh, your payments to the entire uh, your entire world, and you know, based on your payments, you could be uh, you could be targeted, you could be discriminated against. Um, and also, you know, I, I think just not having privacy curdles uh, personal expression. Uh, there, there's things that we want to express in the private sphere that we don't necessarily want to uh, express in a ledger that's going to be recorded uh, for everyone to see for all of eternity, right? So uh, in that respect, pri privacy is super important. And there are different ways uh, that uh, people have tried to tackle this, you know, early on, uh, coin join with... Uh, uh, with Bitcoin and then uh, efforts around uh, ring signatures and crypto notes, confidential transactions. Uh, the most privacy you can gain is basically with zero knowledge, proof of knowledge, like Zcash is doing. Uh, and so for me, that's the most interesting technology to deploy uh, uh, on Tezos to, uh, to have private transactions. So yeah, so you mentioned privacy preserving transaction. And of course, I think many, many of us will, will be in agreement that that's a very important thing. And I think that brings us to another topic, which is, you know, one of the main, main topics around Tesla, which is governance. So how actually would something like that be implemented in governments? How would the community reach agreement? So governance was, of course, one of the main um, selling points, one of the main uh, areas of focus for Tezos. So what's implemented right now in terms of governance? And are there any activities already in Tezos? Uh, in terms of people making proposals or people building systems to vote or like what's the kind of state there right now? Yeah, no. So uh, in, what, in terms of what's implemented, the, the, the voting procedures are described in the, in the white paper is implemented. Uh, so it's uh, uh, a vote in several phases where in one phase, many people make different proposals. Then you have an approval voting phase to so select just one of these proposals. Then each proposal is submitted to a vote. Then you get this into a testing phase, and then after the testing phase, there's, a, there's another vote to approve it. So that's the process. Uh, there hasn't been any uh, proposal made. There's active development in the GitLab repo for Tezos, and so you know probably I think what's going to happen is at some point one of the uh, the master branch will start getting frozen into a proposal branch, and that branch will be uh, uh, will be proposed within the community. Uh, and then yes, yeah, the idea is that the bakers who are uh, 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 who represents a uh, different amount of stakes gets to vote on that uh, on that proposal. So basically, like this, this as I understand it, there's two phases. So one is the phase of uh, like approval voting, which is like should we consider this proposal seriously or not, followed by actual voting, and then uh, in actual voting, I'm assuming there's some form of quorum and percentage of affirmative votes needed. And once that's there, uh, prior to the voting process, the new client code base will already be uploaded somehow to the network. And then if there's enough votes, you switch automatically. Is, yeah. Is that that's, yeah. So the automatic switch that already happened on the network, uh, the network switch, pro, you know, the, the first thing the network does is switch protocol. So the Genesis block in Tezos is actually a block that signs and activates a protocol, which then starts. Um, so the, 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 the protocol change uh, that's, that's happened on the chain it hasn't happened yet as triggered by a vote. So that's the next step. Cool. So when do you expect we'll see you see one of these uh, changes? For governance followed by client switch? Hmm. I, I don't know. Right now there's, um, I think, you know, I, I speak to different uh, teams working on Tezos and I think right now most of these, uh, most of these teams are really uh, using the time after the launch to really get up to uh, Get up to speed on the code base, really understanding in details, uh, clean you know, uh, clean it up as much as possible. Uh, what needs to be clean, uh, add uh, documentation. So I think we're really in a, in, in that phase now. I I don't think it's exactly clear when uh, uh, when there will be the first proposal, but I think def I mean I would be surprised if it if it were in more than six months. I would be surprised. Well, there haven't been any proposals to date. Is another 
No, there hasn't yeah. been proposals to date, but you know, there there's an intention to take whatever is the master branch of the GitLab and make a proposal out of yeah. it. So of course, like there's been quite a bit of skepticism about uh, the idea of there being a vote in a decentralized system followed by an automatic client switch. And one of the issues that has been pointed out by Philip Dayan, who's I think he's from Cornell, is that like cryptocurrency based voting systems are w vulnerable to vote buying on a, on a grand scale. Right, so if you have a normal democratic process, um, let's say the U.S. election, uh, people can bribe voters to vote in a particular way, but then there's no way for them to verify that somebody they bribed actually voted the way they wanted them to, because the voting is probably in the form of some electronic voting machine or paper that doesn't leave a certificate of how the vote happened. But like with with cryptocurrency, there's a there's of course you can build uh, technology that allows people to prove that they voted a particular way, and therefore you can have smart contracts where I, as large scale governance attacker, can create a bounty where I pay X Y Z tesis to people that vote a certain way, and and basically attract bribe an anonymous group of people to vote the way I want by paying them money. Uh, do you think this is, this, is, this is going to be like a practical issue in the Tezos governance mechanism and how will you deal with it? I think this issue is, uh, this issue is, uh, is really interesting and it's strongest when you are trying to do a one person, one vote, right? If you're trying to do one person, one vote, then obviously you're going to have, uh, like a, there can be a lot of bribery happening. And also on top of that, you have the problem of ident identifying people. Uh, in Tezos, the type of vote that you have is more one token, one vote. And so as a result, people already have, uh, you know, they have an incentive to vote uh, uh, in a reasonable way, just based on uh, just based on their stakes. And so you could try to uh, you could try to bribe people. But if, you know, if, if the decision they make is bad, it's going to end up hurting them, then you would need to spend a lot of money for this uh, bribery. And I think ultimately it's better to try and, and prevent bribery through this kind of economic incentives by ensuring skin in the game. Then you know that that then by trying to uh, you know to 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 to, to try to um, to obfuscate vote, but that doesn't mean you can't do both. I mean, there's definitely a very uh, wide literature in uh, uh, in cryptographic voting, and what Tezos is doing is very very uh, uh, simple, and it's all just a public broadcast. At the end of the day, if you don't have something like a, like an isolation boost, it's really hard to uh, prevent the person from just you know giving user key. And the thing is, like we're we're talking about really uh, kind of remote scenarios where, like, oh, you know, you bribe me, but I don't completely trust you, so give me an SGX attestation that you're not gonna get my money back. I mean, you know, people just like trust weird exchanges to not steal their money. So clearly, you know, what's you know what's what's what would stop them from being bribed is not the lack of SGX attestation. It's interesting, can be exercise, but like I would contend that people are much more bribable than even what is uh, what is assumed. So really, the only defense is to uh, a uh, try to uh, align economic incentives so that bribing is not uh, a big issue. And mind you, you can still try to play games and say, hey, everyone who votes for this proposal uh, gets uh, newly created money. Everyone who votes against it loses it, and then everyone is like, oh no, prisoner dilemma. I have to vote. Uh, for it, but there's a lot of delays in these things. Uh, you know, there's long testing periods, and there's enough time for people to coordinate and to say, "Well, that was a stupid vote. Well, that was manipulative," and hard fork out of bad decisions like this. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not really concerned about um, the practicality of these attacks. I'm more concerned about attacks that don't look obviously evil, like you know, master twirling villain, uh, which look like they would be for the benefit of the network. But which actually end up uh, harming the network or devaluing the, ne the, the network. The underrated OCaml contest. Well, that's more about like introducing bugs. Um, it's more of like you well, vote anyways. for my bad proposal. I vote for your bad proposal. Like you vote for yeah. my bad project. I yeah, vote yeah, for yeah. your bad project, and we have an equilibrium that way. Yeah, that's... but you, you need to get eighty percent of people to vote for your bad proposal. That's a wide. That's a wide array of people. You know, the, the voting in Tezos is not so much about like, oh my God, let's all agree to do this change. It's, I, you know, it's like, I want to push this change. Oh no, 
How am I going to do that? I get to get so many people to agree. It's going to be hard. Uh, the point of governance in Tezos is that if something is really obviously good, it should go through. Uh, if it's not, it's going to be hard for it to change. And in some sense, it makes it makes it can make changes to the protocol harder. So imagine you have a protocol where you say there's never going to be any change whatsoever. We can't change it. If you change it, it's a scam. Okay. So you try to have a, a cultural uh, uh, taboo against it. But then people are going to say, oh. But we really need to change it because, you know, we have this and that and we really need to change it. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to hard fork. Okay, well, if you're hard forking, what else is on the table? And then now you can do everything. Whereas if, you're if you have a protocol and you say, well, we really need to change it. And the answer is like, well, of course you can change it. All you need to do is first convince the prediction market that it is a valuable protocol. And then you need to get a coalition of 80% to vote for your protocol twice after a long period of testing and all of this stuff then now you can't really edit it for a hard fork anymore because there's a viable pass for inclusion, even if this pass is hard. So having some flexibility in protocol changes can actually make you more resilient to protocol changes. That's, that's a paradox, of, uh, <laughs> that's a paradox of, uh, of having formal governance. Uh, the other thing is uh, there's interesting protections that you can use at the protocol level. So protocol in Tezos introspect into the change. So you can't, you don't just accept anything that people send you. First of all, everything is sandboxed. So a protocol that you accept is just a pure function. It's not going to be something that accesses a file system or, any, or anything like that. The second thing is it's a set of files. So you can choose which file you're allowed to change and which file you're not allowed to change. So in the OCaml module system, it's pretty straightforward to create a module that handles all of the token creation and token movement and token destruction. So it's fairly straightforward in Tezos to have a rule that says, hey, you know what? You can change a protocol with a vote, but you cannot have you cannot create more than ten percent of token a year. Like you can't do that. If you want to do that, you need ninety five percent of the vote, for example. So you can you can introduce these rules. You can go even further and say we'll have a proof checker in the protocol, and then unless you have a formal proof that you verify such and such properties, then you won't accept uh, accept your change. So there's a, there's a lot of things you can do to improve the governance beyond uh, simple voting. It, the point of voting in Tezos is not to give everyone a voice. It's to make good decisions. Yeah, I think the biggest um, misconception that we come across is that Arthur and I are somehow like pro-democracy and we came up with Tezos because we're like pro-democracy and pro everyone having like a voice and a, and a way to express themselves. Like really governance is um, a procedure that's a means to an end and the end is, is a better way to incorporate new innovations into the blockchain. Um, and so it can take a lot of different manifestations beyond just one one token, one token, one vote. Yeah. Um, you know, people, the, the idea of democracy is not to, so I, I think in, in general political system, the idea of democracy is not to give power to the people, it's to destroy power. Because you have a lot of people who have a lot of power, and instead of coordinating and, and making a revolution, they're going to vest all of this power into someone who doesn't really have any power. And so that's a really neat way of, like, not having power and not doing things in uh in, in in a government, I mean that, that that's my take on it, more than uh, more than anything. But you know what? There are people who participate in Tezos because they love the participating aspect, and maybe I'm completely wrong about it. And maybe Tezos is great for reasons other than the one I believe it's good for, and that's completely fine. There's a lot of smart people who are very welcome to disagree about these things. And it's that's the beauty of having a community of like you know thousands and thousands of people who have their own unique voice in things. So um, if this would be very unfun if it was just. Uh, if it was just the voice or opinions of a few select folks who were coming at the table. I mean, the, the opinion is overused, but it's strong opinion weekly held. Yep. <laughs> cool. Well, let's speak briefly a bit about, well, uh, first of all, on, on the governance side, I'm super excited to see this in, you know, in real, real action when some proposals come and, and we will actually see some upgrades and all of that. And, uh, and I think it's going to be one of the most interesting areas of, of experimentation in governance in the next few years. And, you know, let's see which way it goes. But I would love to speak a bit at this point about the Tezos community. So there has a community emerged since the fundraiser and since the network launch. So can you speak a bit about, you know, what are some of the main players in this community? And also, what is the role of uh, sort of your company, uh, DLS, uh, you know, going forward and in the relationship between the company and the foundation? Um, so I'll, I'll let Arthur take the hard question first, which is what's the relationship between DLS and uh, the foundation? Because uh -huh. I think that's something that's 
very poorly understood, but deserves uh, clarification. Yeah, so so originally Tezos was developed by this company called uh, Dynamic Ledger Solutions. Uh, it was a pretty boring name. I think it's, it's, it was purposefully boring. Uh, and, it, um, and it was uh, developed with a team of programmers uh, at OCaml Pro. And so the foundation signed the Tezos Foundation signed a contract with DLS back in uh, back in June, I think, of uh, of 2017. And after that, uh, they basically took on the responsibility to uh, um, to uh, to develop the project and to further its ecosystem. And so when Gavers and Guido reneged on their obligation to do that, uh, DLS uh, tried to keep in uh, to keep involved to keep the uh, project going. But so you know now that uh, the foundation has a functional board, uh, we've taken back seats and. Tezos itself, it's being developed by uh, many companies, uh, uh, Nomadic, Obsidian, Cryptonomic. So, um, and there's uh, one that's just started in uh, in Japan. So there's really an array of, uh, of developers around the world working on uh, on Tezos. And I think, like for for Cassian, uh, for Cassian and I, at least for myself, what I uh, what I try to do is uh, is meet with these developers and uh, uh, you know and try to sit down with them and say like, uh, hey, you know, here's what I think about the consensus algorithm, uh, this type of uh, this type of things. Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time evangelizing, but we have no formal role within the foundation and DLS doesn't or hasn't over for over a year um, had any contractual relationships with any development shop. So um, it's a very interesting, uh, interesting yoke it wears reputationally. But um, yeah, it doesn't have it doesn't have any formal role within development um, current day. Um, but as I mentioned before, there's like um, tens of thousands of people in the Tezos yeah. community. Yeah, we did have a contract back in uh, back in January. Oh, yes, we... but it's been a while. It's, no, I, June, I, June. No, 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 in in January, Kathleen. Oh, but, okay. But not with the not with the yeah. foundation. But with it, over, yeah, okay. It, it fe- it's it's felt like more than a year. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, it's it's time dilation is an issue here. Um, but I digress. Um, yeah, back in in July of 2017, at least. Um, you know. 30,000 wallets are open for the Tezos fundraiser. This represents, you know, tens of thousands of people across the world. Um, there's many more people in the Tezos community, arguably, than those who participated in the fundraiser. But um, for sake of argument, you know, that's a good good metric or a good number to kind of put our hat on. Um, you know, since the fundraiser has, uh, has occurred and since the board has been governed by, um, you know, sane people, uh, there's been a lot of uh, interesting, in, interesting, more formal and informal ways that the community has come come around. Um, one of them has been in in terms of um, uh, nonprofit foundations across the world, um, notably uh, Tezos Japan and Tezos Korea, which have taken the mantle of of evangelizing and um, creating meetups and whatnot. Um, uh, and baking know, classes and baking classes, uh, yeah. and and really getting into the the roots of the technology. So. Um, we see a lot of uh, strong presence in Asia and strong presence in um, the U.S. and in Europe um, for for interest in Tezos um, as and Latin America as well. Like Tezos Brazil is a pretty big baking uh, baking cohort. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's truly really the strength of the network. Like that's something that can't be easily either you know disbanded or uh, or replicated. Um, so we see that as a true strength of Tezos is the number of people who have. Uh, you know, shown an interest in this technology. Just to clarify briefly, so you mentioned DLS had a, I mean, of course, DLS was the company you, you founded and that was originally started working on Tezos. And you mentioned that DLS had a contract and was kind of working for Tezos Foundation, but not anymore. So is it, does that mean at the moment, neither of you has a kind of, you know, formal work uh, engagement on behalf of, of Tezos and you're just sort of working uh, on your own time or like, what does it look like at this point? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we're I, working on our own time. I like the term fun employment, but, you know, <laughs> not formally working sounds good too. Yeah. And, and is the idea that down the line are you are you planning on building dls into like an organization or like so you don't have it or or building out a team to work on tezos or maybe starting i don't know different types of uh, projects or building things on tezos so what do you what are your long-term plans no no so the the agreement was that the fund uh you know uh, dls itself would be uh acquired by the uh uh by the uh by the tezos uh, foundation you know it remains to be seen what you know what what they want to do with it but uh you know, that hasn't happened. We haven't made money yet, but we have a pretty comfortable lifestyle, so we're not in any rush. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just logically, like, you know, Arthur and I are 
hold officer positions in DLS. I'm the CEO or there's a CTO. Um, moving forward, I think it makes more sense for me to focus on the application layer, for example, and it makes more sense for Arthur to focus on um, the protocol layer, as he's just outlined. He has many ideas about it. Um, I have less conviction about what types of um, libraries ought to be added and, and whatnot. So um, so we just, in general, like our natural uh, our natural interests kind of lead us to, to separate at this point. Um, and so I, I, you know, I'll look forward to doing my next thing. Um, and Arthur do his uh, his his role with Tezos, whatever he winds up wanting to do. Um, but the logical endpoint for our association with DLS has always been, um, you know, the launch of a network that was robust enough uh, that the foundation felt comfortable with. So um, holding to that, uh, holding to that, you know, uh, I guess milestone, um, it doesn't really make much sense for DLS to to operate much further. Yeah. So essentially, like uh, as DLS, you you mentioned earlier in the show that you have a put option with the foundation, which means that once the network is functioning well, maybe even better than today, and it has met certain metrics, then DLS, the company, can be sold to the foundation, and then you, as the promoters of that company, will receive like I think ten percent of Tezis and a percentage of the fundraiser uh, proceeds, and thereafter sort of you can form your own other companies to either focus on protocol development or application development. And this will be completely independent of the Tezos Foundation. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. Okay. So Kathleen, would you, do you have a particular application level project in mind that you would want to pursue that you feel strongly for? Oh yeah. Well, I think, um, I, I think, I mean, problem to having blockchain technology adopted broadly construed is that many people don't know how to interact with, uh, interact with the blockchain. Um, in particular, smart contracts seem to intimidate people, and rightfully so. It's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, and so uh, one thing I was thinking of is like, hey, you know, there's a bunch of different use cases that everyone spews on panels at, at all these different conferences. Um, the one that I find to be the most engaging is online video games, because I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the most popular applications that, that started to use Bitcoin uh, was a Magic the Gathering exchange. Uh, so these people have a sort of uh, natural natural disposition towards um, using digital assets first. And so I want to focus my efforts on understanding how people might interact with smart contracts. And it makes sense to that end uh, to use uh, video games as the hook um, for, for building up better applications and tools. And I found a really cool co-founder. Hopefully we'll have some news um, over the next few weeks. Um, about the exact direction we want to take things in, but I don't want to jinx myself. So um, thank you for asking, and I'm sorry I can't be a little bit more explicit with my intention, but uh, that's the idea. Yeah, no. So I, and I think the main uh, the main contribution I can do to uh, to Tezos is uh, keep seeking in the direction of uh, you know the the three directions we've mentioned, which were uh, consensus, you know the, the which kind of uh, which kind of consensus algorithms are going to be uh, most helpful for uh, for Tezos. Uh, how to get uh, security in a code base uh, and in uh, and in the smart contracts which are written around Tezos, uh, and also especially governance. You know how to improve the governance model. Uh, very explicitly, the, the voting mechanism is a bootstrap mechanism for Tezos, and so improving that with pseudo key, uh, with constitutionalism uh, and rules ar around which amendments are permissible and not permissible. Um, that's uh, mostly what I want to be uh, uh, researching and uh, and developing and um, essentially uh, proposing to uh, to the community. We've spoken a little bit about this before, but you know, since Tezos, the original Tezos concept was developed, of course, the, the blockchain space and especially the space for your know, next generation blockchains is becoming you know, extremely uh, competitive and extremely active. And I think also a lot of investors and the VCs, they basically, they saw Ethereum and there was such a massive amount of money made with Ethereum. And then they were all like, oh no, we, we didn't make any of this money. Uh, so now we have to invest in the next thing. And so I think because of that, we've seen a you know, massive investment in, you know, next generation blockchain project. And, and many of those are, are working, you know, with, with large teams. So there's things like Cosmos, Definity, Polkadot, Algorand, EOS, and, and many others, you know, with also lots of money. One of these is not like the others. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the qu interesting questions then becomes the differentiation, right? Like, uh, which of those is, you know, is it going to be winner take all or are there particular areas where a project is going to do better? 
So how do you see Tezos differentiated in this aspect? And do you think that there are pretty particular types of application where Tezos will do best in? So, yeah, you know, there's different ways to differentiate. One way to differentiate is you can be Bitcoin. And you're like, well, you know, we're the first one, we're the most legitimate one. And obviously we're the, you know, obviously we're going to win. And then if you convince enough people of that, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's one, that's one way to uh, differentiate yourself. If you're not Bitcoin, it's trickier. Uh, and I don't think you can do it by just having better technology, um, especially since most of this technology is open source. And so as long as you have other teams uh, who are competent and who can integrate that, you know, who can observe good technology, uh, who can be wise enough to not have the not invented here syndrome uh, and adopt it uh, inside their own platforms, you know, I, I don't think technology becomes an advantage. So what really becomes important is how good your community of core developers is and how easily you can improve and incrementally uh, uh, develop on your platform. Uh, people make a big deal about the entire uh, you know developer ecosystem in Ethereum, and it's certainly a strength, but it's all an application layer uh, ecosystem. There's not a whole lot of, uh, of core developers. And so having ha having a, a really, really strong core developers who are really um, uh, personally invested in your project, uh, who really want to uh, you know, make, make, it, uh, make it a big success, uh, that's that I think uh, allows you to to integrate the technology that uh, that the different um, projects are having. And so, at the end of the day, I think the differentiator becomes community and governance. If you have a large community and a good governance model, then it be, then it's then it's, that's something that's hard to uh, to compete with. Yeah, and and I mean, obviously, you know, to some extent, we think those are strengths that Tezos has. So we're we're you know. There's a bias here. Yeah, there's a, a clear bias here. But in general, I just think, um, you know, if you look back at other projects that launched over the past few years that had a lot of technical strengths, you had things like NXT, you had things like Stellar, so on and so forth. And they sort of they sort of came off with a bit of a whimper um, because they didn't sort of have this organic, um, natural community behind them. Um, and I think that's telling on a few fronts. It, it's a little bit in in governance, but it's also a bit in uh, in in the message that they had around them and the, and the myth that they had around them. So Tezos, um, you know, you could say many things about it, but um, one thing is for certain is it's got this sort of grassroots um, organic quality to it um, that allows people to, to really get involved in the, in the heart of the um, algorithm by, uh, by allowing for this inclusive, uh, inclusive uh, algorithm. So I think that's something that like at least gives it an advantage over other projects. And the, the other things like, you know, technological, um, advances are things that Tezos was meant to incorporate because it, it anticipated these things. Um, so I don't think. Uh, I yeah. Mean, yeah. It's also you know it's also a field where you succeed by not face planting. So you know if you're uh, around long enough and and you stick around and you don't have major problems and and you and, and you keep being used just by by virtue of doing this for a long time, I think you gain uh, you get a lot of uh, credibility and uh, uh, and resilience. Yeah. Uh, just by just by doing this. So. And it, and, it, and it's not easy. It's not easy to have longevity in this space. It, it's tough because a lot of the narratives around other projects um, really start um, around what they what they promise to deliver, and very very few of them actually focus on what, what's there today. Um, there's sort of this romanticism around what people say they're going to do that that drives a lot of um, invitation for comparison. But if we look at like what's actually been shipped, uh, you know, it's 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 a mm. bit of a murkier territory. It's also, you know, development priority because you still have efforts to make. And at the end of the day, you know, if you're not, if, if you're spending a lot of, you know, if you're spending a lot of, if, if your community spends a lot of time uh, developing solutions for uh, getting a million transactions per second, and it turns out no one needs it. Yeah. Then you waste a lot of time. Whereas if your community developed, um, I don't know, for example, all solutions for having uh more privacy in your transaction, it turns out that a lot of people want that, then uh, then you end up having more more staying powers because of that. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on. It was really a pleasure to to you know speak again about Tezos and to hear a bit an update about the project. And it's been fascinating to watch how the project has developed and the kind of ecosystem has started emerging since the, the mainnet launch and the beta launch. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having thanks us. For having us. 
And yeah, thanks so much for listening for once again tuning in. If, if you want to learn more about Tezos, of course, we'll have links to many of the things we talked about in the show notes so you, you can learn more about it. And if you want to support the show, you can leave us an iTunes review that helps new people find the show. And we're very grateful for that. And yeah, we look forward to being back next week. So see you then. Bye.